Hello, my name is Veer Animus of VA Games. Today's fight takes place in Karg Island. I'm going to be flying the Americans AH-1Z Viper with my new gunner, Sony. And this match actually started off as uh, an empty match. It was a scrimmage between a few of the DHM members, uh, myself, Sony, Bossman, J-Spec, uh, the leader, Mac Daddy, um, Crossbow, and Megan. We were all just kind of we were split between two teams, and we were just we were it was a practice session. Um, there were a few you know random people that joined here and there, but for the most part, it was just a, a private DHM thing, small match. But uh, very shortly after this game begins, the lobby actually fills up, and uh, the game is totally on at that point. The rest of the DHM members you know rebalance the server, switch switch sides, so that we're all on the same team, we're all working together. My initial expectations for this match were admittedly very low. It was a, a scrimmage match, and I don't usually keep that kind of footage. I record everything on the off chance that something strange or amazing actually does happen, and this is actually a very good example of how that can happen, because this match turns around, and it becomes one of the better you know, pieces of flying footage that I have. Uh, this, this turned around very well in our favor, and I think this is an excellent display of how DHM can work together. They do a very good job on the ground, and I think we did a fantastic job in the air, considering it was three-on-one in the sky the whole time. Uh, we didn't have any jet support at all, and later on you'll actually see why. One of, one of our blueberries takes one of our jets in order to taxi himself over to our rearmost objective, Objective Alpha. It's the closest objective to our, to our deployment, but he decided he needed to waste one of our jets in order to get there. But that's okay, because in the end, this does turn out to be one of the finest games. I'm very proud of the way this turned out. Um, there's a lot of really cool maneuvers that, that we pull off, and a lot of really cool shots that we make. And I'm very happy with, so I have no complaints about this fight whatsoever. As the title of this video should imply, I'm going to be using this commentary to discuss the various elements of dogfighting in the helicopter. And the first point I would like to make about dogfighting in the helicopter is that you should not be dogfighting in the helicopter. Ideally, you will have two jets on your team that are backing you up, and keeping the skies clear, and keeping other aircraft off your back. You should be focused as a helicopter pilot and as a gunner. You should be focused on targeting ground units, that is, infantry and enemy armor, with special emphasis on enemy armor. Everybody knows how devastating a single tank can be to an infantry offensive, and it is absolutely vital to keep your infantry on the ground because your infantry is going to be what takes your checkpoints and a single tank can really mess that up for you. So your main job is to kill tanks. Keep your infantry clear, and your jet's job is to keep the air clear so that you can keep the ground clear for your infantry. See how that works? It's all about working together. So while you can engage in dogfights with other air vehicles, you really shouldn't unless you absolutely have to, and you should only absolutely have to if you're being attacked and you have to defend yourself. And on that note, it pleases me greatly to report that the attack helicopter is especially proficient at attacking other air vehicles when the need arises. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves and jump right into the combatives, I do want to go over very briefly my loadout as the pilot for the helicopter, because I believe that will shed some light on what you are about to see in this video. And in going over my decisions for my loadout, I am not going to be discussing the uh, heat seekers or the rocket pods, because those are by default something that you have to take as the attack helicopter in every situation, so they are not decisions and I will not be discussing them as decisions. And as far as decisions are concerned, the vehicle upgrades decision for your attack helicopter is going to be the most difficult one. And that's true really only because the vehicle upgrades is the only choice that helicopter pilot has other than countermeasures, and we'll discuss those later. It is usually very common for a helicopter pilot to choose to boost his offensive capability or the offensive capability of his gunner by using something such as the laser painter and the guided missile combination, which is particularly effective against other helicopters, or maybe perhaps the guided rockets to, uh, to increase accuracy against other vehicles, but really the best thing that a helicopter pilot can do for himself and his gunner is to increase survivability. And I know I just got done explaining how you should never be dogfighting and how you should always, you know, ideally have uh, a pair of jet pilots that are backing you up and keeping you clear. Unfortunately, the, uh, the reality of the situation is that that's rarely going to happen. And especially the better you are, the more you're going to attract attention from not only people on the ground with Stinger missiles, but also from the jet pilots, and they're going to recognize you as a threat, and they're going to try to take you down. 
In fact, most expert jet pilots will look at a helicopter as free points. Now when I first started flying, I ran with the laser painter and my gunner was Soul Reaper at the time and he ran with the guided rocket and together we were able to, we slaughtered every helicopter that came our way. And I was actually able to fight you know, some of the jet pilots. Um, if they were a particularly good jet pilot, they would, they would ruin me every time because they'd come up behind me. I would have no idea where they're shooting me from and I wouldn't be able to maneuver in the right way to get away from them so they, they'd get the kill. And that was, that was a big problem for us for a really long time, was that we just did not have the jet support that we needed. All of that changed almost instantaneously when I discovered the air radar, because at that moment, the jet pilots lost their number one power over me as a helicopter pilot. And that power is the ability to break line of sight by flying straight up. When a helicopter pilot is engaged by a jet, primarily the jet will come straight down on top of the helicopter, and it won't be perfectly straight down, it will be off to one side. And they'll be coming down at you at a very, very sharp, steep angle. And the problem with that is that if you don't know which way they're coming from, which way they're really oriented, if you start flying in a direction that isn't toward them, you're flying away from them. And if you're flying away from them, you're putting more distance between you and the jet. And what that does is give them more room to shoot at you. And I haven't timed it myself, but what I can tell you with absolute certainty is that it takes no time at all for a jet pilot to shred a helicopter with his main machine gun. So it should be axiomatic that you want to reduce the amount of time that the jet pilot can shoot at you. The only way to reduce the amount of time a jet pilot can shoot at you other than outright killing him is to fly toward him and shorten the distance between you and him. And the only way you can fly toward the jet is if you know where the jet is. And once the jet pilot breaks line of sight, which is exceptionally easy to do against a helicopter, the only way to know where he is relative to you is by using a radar. Of course, the helicopter pilot can take advantage of the third-person perspective and get a wide-angle shot around the helicopter, uh, sort of. But unfortunately, the good jet pilot is going to know better than to fly straight at the level of the helicopter and will fly straight up, in which case that third-person perspective is not going to avail you. And of course, air radar is not just good for the jet pilots. You can also use it for helicopters. And uh, I do know one of my weaknesses when I started flying with, with Soul Reaper was that we would be flying and we would shoot down the helicopter and, you know, we'd have some fun with that and maybe, maybe kill him several times. Eventually, what will happen is we'll start attacking a ground target and we'll get complacent and we will get focused on that ground target and forget to look out for the helicopter. And then he'll come up behind us and he'll get the drop on us and that would be the best way for him to take us down. So uh, with air radar, that will never happen to you because as soon as the air, you know, as soon as the helicopter comes towards you, you should be able to see it on the radar unless he's really smart and flies below radar, which is below 25 meters. And uh, that is an effective way to counter air radar, but for the most part, they don't do that. And it is the best way for you to, to really be able to know when you're under attack by something. If you see that red blip on your radar, you know what's coming at you and from where it's coming at you and you know how to get cover and if you ever see if you're ever watching me fly and all of a sudden you see I start to twist and turn or whatever it's because I'm looking at the radar and I can see that there's a jet getting ready to position uh, position itself to shoot at us or perhaps it's already locked but uh, air radar tells you all that and now that I've experienced it I won't fly without it now this next bit is going to be a little bit controversial, I admit, because I understand entirely that the community largely favors the ECM jammer over the IR flares for the countermeasures um, for both the helicopter and the jet, but I personally disagree. I think the flares is the only way to go for the helicopter, and the ECM jammer is, is actually very good for a jet pilot. Now in order for you to understand this, we're going to have to talk a little bit about the medicate. And before we can do that, you have to understand at the fundamental level what these countermeasures are actually doing to protect you when you're in the skies. The way the heat-seeking missiles work is via an onboard computer that can track the infrared heat signature of the helicopter's engines. This is why such launchers can't target any helicopter without a pilot, because without the pilot the engines aren't running, and thus they're not generating enough infrared heat to be recognized as an actual target. What IR flares do is confuse this tracking system by kind of acting as a decoy source of infrared heat that, when near enough to the helicopter, can cause missiles to prematurely detonate against the flares instead of against the vehicle. This is a stark contrast to the function of the ECM jammer, which, instead of actually corrupting the tracking of the incoming missile itself, it jams the targeting of the launcher. 
That is to say that the IR flares redirect incoming missiles, and the ECM jammer prevents such heat-seeking warheads from ever being launched in the first place. And at first glance, this does sound like a superior countermeasure, and it's most likely the reason that players seem to favor it. And this is where the metagame comes in. In order to actually lock onto the helicopter, the launcher or the laser must have a direct line of sight on the helicopter in order to maintain the lock and affect the missile away. In the case of a laser designation, the laser is what locks onto the helicopter, and the laser-guided launchers like javelins lock onto the laser and not the helicopter. So if the line of sight is broken, the lock signal strength will begin to falter, and the audio cue for this is the frequency of the lock tone, and of course whether or not the lock ultimately breaks. If you do get locked and you dive below radar and start flying away in any arbitrary direction, if you pass behind an object that can be as innocuous as a hill or a rock, and the lock begins to break, you can immediately infer the general direction of the attacker. This is because the line of sight is actually a straight line. For instance, say that you flew around a rock, and the lock broke. If you draw a line from where you were when the lock broke to the object that effectively broke the lock, and extend that straight line out across the battlefield, the source of the lock must lie somewhere on that line. Given that the lock has a limited range to just a few hundred meters, you can kind of take the topography of the battlefield with that information and make a very educated guess on where the lock was coming from. You can inform your gunner and decide how best to engage that threat. This is a technique that I like to call lock reading, and it's something that I have never seen anyone else do or ever even discuss. It will take a bit of a keen intuition and some quick thinking, but it is absolutely a trainable skill, you can hone it, and it will make you into a fearsome adversary if you combine it with some finely tuned aerobatic ability. And although flares will not stop an engineer from reacquiring the lock after the dump, if you execute these kinds of evasive maneuvers immediately after the initial lock, you have a very good chance of flying around something that's ultimately going to interrupt that lock. Even if the lock doesn't entirely break, just slowing down that lock can buy you a critical fraction of a second that can give you just enough time to either reload your flare cache or at the very least be far enough away from danger that you can safely land and repair. That being said, flares are not without their inherent faults. There is no setup that can protect you perfectly from all threats at all times. There are times when an ECM jammer would be useful, such as against a main battle tank with a CITV station. However, it's about risk assessment. You gotta truly know your own abilities and limitations as a pilot, and about configuring your loadout to complement those abilities in order to increase your chances of success. Nothing is a guarantee. If the enemy team is spread out and they're coordinating a ground-based stinger offensive on you, chances are you're going to take a few hits and you're going to get shot down. Although these cases are rare, they uh, at least they are on console, they are possible and they do sometimes occur against effective clan-based squads. In these circumstances, the pilot has to make adjustments on the fly at his or her own discretion. In any event, as I briefly discussed in the last video, awareness is going to be the key characteristic of a successful player. You need to be able to read the battlefield to discern friendly and enemy positions, navigate you know, terrain to avoid dangerous situations, but uh, just keep in mind that if the pilot is getting more kills than the gunner, either the pilot is not doing his job properly or the gunner is not doing his. The pilot has some very powerful offensive capabilities at his disposal, and no one would argue against that, but offense should be the secondary concern for a pilot. The first and foremost job of any helicopter pilot is to keep the chopper in the sky and give his gunner the opportunities that he needs to spot enemies and get the kills and, and vehicle destroys that he needs to get. As I tell my gunners, I can fly the helicopter and I can evade threats, but they are my eyes. The helicopter pilot is a primarily support role whose only objective is to put his gunner in a position to do significant damage to enemy formations. When you get better at this, you can get really creative with your approach. Battlefield 3 runs on the Frostbite engine, which is famous now for the detailed level of destruction it allows. Battlefield takes full advantage of this, as virtually every single wall is destructible in one way or another, and many smaller buildings can be demolished entirely. Like if an enemy soldier takes shelter in the warehouses on Firestorm, you can actually circle straight the structure and use rocket pods to blow away all of the walls, every single one of them. This will expose the enemy hiding inside, and it gives your gunner a great opportunity to kind of infiltrate the hive, you know, so to speak, and score some kills. Twice in this video alone, you can see us pursuing a player that took shelter in two separate buildings. The first one was the gas station at Alpha, and the second one was a building near Bravo. In both of these instances, my gunner and I were attempting to either coax the enemy out of his hiding place, or at least, you know, pin him down there long enough for us to bring the entire building down on top of him. And that's eventually what happened, and I thought that was, I thought that was beautiful. Even if you can't actually see the targets on the ground, sometimes it's a good idea just to take the shots anyway. 
You know, sometimes you'll get hit markers, and sometimes you'll actually get kills. Sometimes you'll get nothing at all, but sometimes you'll hit an area, you know, just enough, just close enough to an enemy, such that you're going to scare him into motion, and that will make him visible to you. When flying becomes second nature, you're going to be able to improvise with the environment and use conventional things in unconventional ways to take the advantage. That, my dear friends, is the hallmark of a good pilot. There is a difference between being good and being skillful. Good describes a state of all-around competency and cognitive agility, whereas the word skillful describes the level of mechanical control a player has over the helicopter. A skillful pilot is not necessarily a good pilot if he or she has not learned to apply the various skills to practical situations. Strive first to be a good pilot, and the development of those core skills is going to follow. I left in the two mistakes that I made near the end to illustrate that even expert pilots are often capable of mistakes. A lot of them, in fact, because flying at this level is typically not easy. Um, unless you're a prodigy, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, you're going to crash, you're going to get shot down, and you really shouldn't let this discourage you. Take my mistakes, for example. In the first instance, I was being double teamed by some jets, and I attempted to dive below radar to prevent any, you know, incoming missile locks. Unfortunately, my skids scraped on the ground and twisted the helicopter right into the rocks. The second time was almost a repeat of the first. I dove after firing on an incoming helicopter just to try to play it safe, but I rolled way too hard to the left and just couldn't recover. So all said and done, we died three times. The first was that jet ram very early in the game, and the second two were miscalculated maneuvers. Still, I do think the rest of this match went as well as I could have ever hoped, and if you enjoyed this video or you learned something from the commentary, please rate, comment, and subscribe. I will be making a lot more of these videos uh, in the very near future. If you do want to play with us, uh, we absolutely welcome all comers. Uh, the clan name is DHM on the Xbox 360. You can contact uh, jspecky27, macdaddy, myself, any anyone really with a DHM tag. And uh, jspecky actually hosts a server for our clan. It's uh, jspecky27's DHM server. And there's usually at least one DHM member you know, in it at any given time on a regular day. So drop in and say hello. You know, We encourage everyone to stop in, play with us for a little while. Anyway, I would like to thank uh, the members of DHM, especially the ones that were in this game handling their business on the ground you know, so effectively. Crossbow and Megan did a great job rolling out some tanks. Uh, Jason, Bossman, Mac Daddy were especially helpful in the ground. Uh, they kept those checkpoints under our control almost the whole time and did a great job keeping Sony and I covered from the ground. I would also like to thank you guys for watching. Um, I really do hope that you found this uh, both helpful and entertaining and that I may see you again next time.